you want to know the ending, how it's all going to turn out, the aftermath of Trump's presidency, don't turn to analysts, Wall Street, or CNN for an accurate portrait of where it's all going, what it's going to look like. Reread Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, set in California around 2027. People in fear, behind walls, gated communities, a woman raped so much she can't stand, gun violence, addiction, fires that can scarcely be put out, people scavenging for food, trying not to become prey, compassion is gone. The main character named Lauren is a hyper-empath. She can feel others' pain, which I think is a metaphor for artists. Whatever you think of Marina Abramovic, her show title is right, the artist is, was always present from the beginning of time until now. Look again at the Hunger Games. The districts are actually concentration camps with gray garb and barbed fences that nod to Nazi Germany. Humans are pitted against each other to survive. Sometime after Trayvon Martin was shot, I finally understood something deep about Star Wars. I've always rooted for good guys, always. Once I heard a friend at the movies rooting for Poison Ivy, Batman and Batgirl's nemesis, and I was shocked that anyone could root for a bad girl. But after Trayvon was killed by George Zimmerman, who walked free, I finally understood what could turn a character's eyes dark. You could become so disillusioned. And then I understood in the Star Wars franchise what made Darth Vader I felt that again after Trump's election. No more green, blue light, only gray, dark, drab, white bones war. Last week I worked with a class I hadn't met before on the subject of Black Lives Matter. I repeated something Greg Gordo had said to a group of students. What if the only justice that we have right now is here, in this room? One of the students said, well, nothing ever changes. So I responded by asking them, are you telling me that you can't change? They were all surprised, shocked by my question. At the end, I asked the class, what have you learned today? A black girl answered as if she were, as if she were channeling Octavia herself, change. It's up to us. film I've seen, and there are not that many, they show real life survivors and the lines are, never again. And some of us like me stare into these films down the long tunnels of history wondering how it could have ever happened at all. That a leader and his minions could be so toxic, so poisonous that you would turn against your neighbors, that you could be so oblivious, brainwashed, scared, desperate to be superior or to survive, that you would do anything, or almost. They say, never again, but it is again. As I look at the deportations, roundups, I'm reminded of Idi Amin when he cast out foreigners, and Forrest Whitaker in the film The Last King of Scotland when he played him, and to see it is again at rallies, at protests, they show the coat hangers and crude instruments women were forced to use in back alley abortions. We say, never again, but taking away women's choices in Planned Parenthood, it is again. Today started out in an argument with a so-called fan who didn't understand why I mentioned race so much in my new book. And that white man is not the first. A black woman asked me too. I wanted to scream, hello. Haven't you seen the news? Didn't you see what happened to Stephon Clark, unarmed and shot in the back six times by police? And no one even cares what happens to women, black, lesbians, or lesbians of color. There's no public outcry. A student once wrote to me in an academic paper that a parent forced her to stop playing sports inside because they, made, they said sports made her more of a dyke. It murdered my student inside because she was an athlete. Yeah, so the white guy I argued with about my book said he was just giving me some good advice from his experience as an empath. I said, I don't need your advice. I have reasons for talking about race and gender and the interpersonal. He said he was just trying to help me. I'll offer this non sequitur. Winnie Mandela died a few weeks ago. She had a great impact on me. I read she was nobility. 
But then, of course, the difference between her and, say, how Princess Diana was treated, everyone accepted and loved Diana's silent, passive status. She was allowed to be gorgeous. No one ever associated her with that dirty colonial stain. There are moments in that recent Winnie Mandela documentary that stand out to me where she buried her face in her hands and she screamed out, as I have so many times, I've been betrayed. The other moment was when she said she was the only ANC member brought to TRC, TRC and made to testify. Also that Nelson Mandela forgave a nation, but he could never forgive her. And I think what was done to Winnie is also done to other black women and working artists. Black women fighting to give language resistance, but it only matters if a celebrity says or does it. At Cape Coast Castle in Ghana, after you've passed the door of no return, there's a plaque donated to the castle by the black tribal elders. It reads, may we never sell ourselves into slavery again. But it is. Um. Oh, wow. really um, well, I'm going to read some more. Is that good? Yeah. 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 Yes. yeah. All right. So this is um, this is getting ready to be published in the Brooklyn Rail for June, and uh, it's my poem for Stonewall. It's called Mark Safe, and this is my first time reading it out loud. So push me back. Okay. I want to thank the maestro, Tim Gunn. <laughs> Heidi Klum, also every episode of Project Run Runway and Runway All-Stars, every gay and lesbian contestant that ever sewed stitch sequins to dresses or pantaloons, every queer who ever threw a tantrum walked out and came back to win. Thank you to the Jersey and Atlanta housewives and spin-offs, to all their queer queen besties. I want to thank RuPaul and every queen on every episode of Drag Race, also that dollar store cashier I ran into with my mother in a small town, Massachusetts, who actually thought I was RuPaul and kept calling me Miss Honey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Oprah, and her close friend, designer Nate Burkus. I extend apologies to the lover he lost when the tsunami hits uh, Sri Lanka. I also want to thank Walmart and the M to F trans person who worked behind the register when my mother worked there as a greeter. When eventually they were fired for women for wearing women's clothes, to my shock, my mother said, that's unjust and I think it's discrimination. I want to thank that person, wherever they are. I want to thank that mixed race lesbian Josie on Top Chef or some other cooking show. I want to thank every LGBTQIA person on every show that my mother watched religiously because each and every one of them, in one way or another, prepared my mother at 84 years old for the queer art catalog I was part of that I brought home to show her, called Cast of Characters. Holding my breath, I handed it to her, asked her to guess of all the images, which was mine. She saw the word queer first. Why do you call yourselves that? That's like saying you're niggers. I tried to explain the concept of reclaiming language used against us. My mother refused to listen. She thumbed through the images, eyes wide with wonder. She knows I don't usually show her stuff for many reasons, so she gave her opinion on each image. Ooh, this one with flowers, she pointed. I like this. The next image was of a man with cock and balls out. I don't like this one, she said. <laughs> she persisted onto the next image. Pregnant butch, she said out loud and giggled. A pregnant butch, she said again, as if fascinated by the idea. I don't see yours, but oh, here it is. She fastened on a blue and red watercolor of figures gathered in grief, titled Six Times. It's the family of Stefan Clark, I explained. That black kid from Sacramento, police shot in the back six to eight times, unarmed in his backyard. They said he was a burglar. I wanted to paint the pictures of his family grieving because they had no voice and were made invisible. My mother got quiet, mouthed something like, aha. Her eyes narrowed and full like when I visit and we watch shows about slavery together, like Roots when Chicken George has to leave his son at the crossroads to gain freedom. My mother wants to cry, but she doesn't. She commands me to show the catalog to my father. Later, she asks to take a picture because she wants to show my 90-year-old aunt. 
On another front, in New York this year, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots. My queer friends complain about all the festivities as the monster that ate New York. But I say I'm excited by it all, if only because I can go home to my family, because of all those kings and queens before me, marked safe. She wrote for Colored Girls, and she was a friend of mine. And so, and I know Fred has done something for Colored Boys. So, <laughs> the internet has transformed our grieving patterns. Everything comes and goes so quickly. After death, there's tremendous outpouring, and then a few weeks later, years nothing. I've come now to watch all who shaped me die. Never got to write about or even register Prince, then Aretha, then Intazaki people without whom I couldn't have form, formed my voice, my identity. I joke now there's probably not a black girl alive who came through a theater program in the United States who hadn't encountered the work of Intazaki Shange. In fact, I know some university theater program banned for colored girls from being performed. Choose something else, they say, because it's been performed so much. Hmm. And I chuckle thinking about how many times Intazaki's words were used by black girls as audition monologues for theater. And I will be presenting the lady in green, or the lady in yellow. And then them skipping around the room talking about Tucson Louverture, or the infamous somebody almost walked off with all of my stuff. Or if they were really dramatic, they might perform the lady in red with the perils of Bo Willie Brown, a crazed Vietnam vet. And that infamous last line about how he dropped the kids out of the window. In our college production, I was the lady in blue, a character that was rather obscure in compared to the others. I remember the beginning of the choreo poem playing childhood games and then being frozen while a woman came around and tagged us away. I'm outside Houston, I'm outside Chicago, and this is for colored girls who considered suicide but moved to the ends of their own rainbows. The play was such that you could memorize everyone else's lines. I struggled initially with how to pronounce Intazaki's name and read her black vernacular and slash mark punctuation. But it was like reading Morrison's Beloved, which I tried at least five times before I understood. And then the codes gave way to an ecstasy and understanding. Her words became mine. Even though I was a suburb girl, the kinds of male partner violence that Intazaki spoke of was foreign to me. Later in a conversation at her house, she remarked she didn't want older women to perform for colored girls as the words became too bitter in their mouths, a point we starkly disagreed on. But Zaki's words were the first to unlock an experience in literature, a, a pool, a mirror by which black girls could see themselves. And I guess like Harriet Tubman, she freed a lot of souls. That said, she was a hero of mine. And so when I uh, first had the chance to meet her as an adult, many, many years after undergrad, I was honored in Florida. A friend of mine from Boston managed her and went to meet her at the New York Poets Cafe. It was after her second or third stroke, and she was dancing with her hands and hair. Her arms were raised above her head, and she moved wildly to the music. Her dreadlocks with gold beads moved with her. Afterwards, we hugged like we were old friends or sisters. I saw her many times after that. Once she came to see me perform, and I couldn't believe I was performing for the woman who'd given me words, and later it was revealed to me that she leaned over to Claude and said, Pamela's quite brilliant, isn't she? Yeah. And then there was a beautiful moment when my mentor became an equal, a colleague. I don't think I can ever impart what she's meant, but I will always remember her after two strokes with her hands over her head, raised to the sky, God dancing. 